Welcome everyone. My name is Cynthia Holtz and I'm the Executive Director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. Uh, thank you all for attending our webinar today, Embracing AI in Academic Libraries, an Introduction to ChatGPT. Um, so I just want to start with a few housekeeping uh, things. Uh, first of all, just to ensure an optimal experience for everyone, um, if you can please uh, ensure that you're muted and uh, if you can turn off your video, uh, just because we do have some attendees from low bandwidth areas, uh, that would be appreciated. Uh, if you want to ask questions uh, in the session, um, we, you can do so verbally, but uh, it, you can unmute yourself then and show your video at that point, or you can put them in the chat. We will be monitoring that. Um, and I'll leave it to Margaret and, uh, uh, and Caitlin to uh, indicate whether they wish to have uh, questions in them uh, as they come or just to save them to the end. So we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, Otherwise, I would like to uh, acknowledge that Call CBPA represents member libraries across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. In Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit of Nunatsivut and Nunatukavut, the Innu of Natasinan, the Beothic, and the Mi'kmaq peoples. In Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. And in New Brunswick, libraries are found on the land of the Wooly Stoic, uh, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy peoples. Uh, we at CALL CBPA wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, uh, to welcome and introduce our two speakers today. Uh, Margaret Vale is a librarian and software developer with a unique background in both fields. Uh, she holds a Bachelor of Computer Science and a Master of Library and Information Studies from Dalhousie University and currently serves as a Systems and Data Services Librarian at St. Francis Xavier University. Uh, Margaret's expertise in both libraries and computer science allows her to bridge the gap between these two areas and provide innovative technological solutions to advanced library services. Uh, Caitlin Fuller is a scholarly communications and health sciences librarian at St. Francis Xavier University. Uh, Caitlin joined St. of X from the Nova Scotia Community College, uh, where she taught in the library and information technology program for the eCampus. Uh, with over five years of experience as the education librarian for the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto, uh, Caitlin is skilled in searching for clinical questions and conducting comprehensive literature searches. She holds an MLIS from Dalhousie University and a Bachelor of Arts from the University of British Columbia. Caitlin has a passion for teaching and supporting students, faculty and staff in their research. Uh, and with that, I will turn over the session to Margaret and Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you all for joining us here online today. We're very excited to see so many of you interested in this topic that we are also interested in. So just uh, one more housekeeping thing is Margaret and I will be sharing the slides and a little handout with some readings and references after this session so you can watch out for that. Next slide. So Margaret and I went through a lot of your responses for like why you're attending this webinar, what you're hoping to learn this webinar, and we tried to group them into a lot of buckets. Um, you know, what is ChatGPT? How do you use it? Strengths and limitations? How can you engage with your students? Academic integrity and plagiarism questions. There was a lot of like optimism that I think this word cloud here that we generated based on your responses indicate like working with how to use understanding learning there's also some fear and anxieties coming through in some of the questions uh so in general we're just trying to paste that this is a you know a one hour introductory webinar um we're going to try our best to answer most of your questions but there was a lot of them so if we don't get to yours exactly uh feel free to put your questions in at the end we have we have time dedicated to answering questions but we're hoping we answer uh, your questions and achieve why you are here with us today. Next slide. Just wanted to start off with why this webinar topic. So this topic was Margaret's idea and when she approached me about it, I was like, 
Yeah, let, let's do it. Um, I'm interested personally in this topic from kind of two perspectives. Uh, one is my scholarly communications hat here at St. FX University, but also as a health sciences librarian, I'm really interested in discovery and how best to connect our users uh, with research that will answer their questions as quickly as possible. And I feel like since I've been a librarian, uh, health sciences librarian, I have been this nebulous cloud of like, one day the robots are going to come and take over and we won't need you to do any searches and you'll never have to talk about mesh again has been like lingering in the background. So when I was working at NSCC in November 2022, I actually first came across a discovery layer that is using some of the technology and the AI that ChatGPT is using called Elicit. And I was like, whoa, like this is kind of actually working. And then I found out about ChatGPT that way. And I'm just, you know, a curious person. I'm a child work as fast as possible, as smart as possible kind of things. I'm like, how could I leverage this? What is this good at? What is it not? And that's why I started just kind of deep diving into reading, watching videos and learning as much as I could to figure out how I could potentially leverage this technology in my work. And I'll pass it over to Margaret. Margaret, you're muted. Oh, I have to mute my phone too. Because I don't know why, but it was beeping. Okay. So I actually didn't hear about this about ChatGPT until January uh, when I saw um, an advertisement go around for a Maple League webinar by Dan Lametti from um, Acadia University. And it was mind blowing. His webinar topic was AI and the end of the academic essay, question mark. And I'm like, this is what I've been hearing about in the periphery that I haven't really been paying attention to because I've generally decided for my mental health that I'm not really interested in following the news. So, but when I saw his webinar, I decided I wanted to learn more. This looked really interesting. And then when ChatGPT um, was exploding in the media, uh, it became really hard to log in to use it. So I purchased a ChatGPT Pro subscription, which I believe is $20 US a month. And at the time, I suggested to Caitlin, hey, Caitlin, you should buy this too. I think she's still on the wait list. So I definitely um, got in there right at the beginning. Caitlin, are you still on the wait list to get into Pro? Yes, I am still waitlisted. I should have taken your advice. And when I um, shared this idea with Caitlin, I it, part of it was because I wanted to be able to learn more myself about ChatGPT. And I find that um, my learning style is very much learning by teaching. So I thought, well, I want to learn more about ChatGPT. Everyone else wants to learn more about ChatGPT. So I'll do a presentation on it. And luckily, Caitlin agreed to um, come along for the ride. Uh, it makes it definitely made it easier having someone to bounce ideas off of, especially for such a new technology. And since I originally didn't have a plan for this presentation, uh, Caitlin and I used ChatGPT to get it to write the abstract. So there's lots of potential here. Uh, so today we're going to talk about how did we get here? What is ChatGPT? Artificial intelligence, large language models, strengths, weaknesses, uh, uses for ChatGPT, and ChatGPT in academic libraries. So I'm going to begin by setting the stage. It is November 2022. Although for me, it was January. So for January, if this was new to you too, you're not alone. But in November 2022, it just seemed like out of nowhere ChatGPT came up. It was launched at the end of November. It really took academia and the world by storm. In January alone, ChatGPT uh, raked up more than 660 million visits to their website. The bank UBS estimate that it took over two months for the software to gain 100 million monthly active users. And in comparison, TikTok took 
nine months to get the same amount of active users, and Facebook took four and a half years. Uh, I believe wholeheartedly that a lot of the sensationalist and alarmist headlines that dominated media coverage um, amplified the popularity of ChatGPT. And it created a lot of, in my opinion, unnecessary fears and anxiety. So I'm really glad that I heard about, first heard about ChatGPT through Dan Lametti's um, webinar, because he really took a relaxed approach to it, saying that ChatGPT is extremely helpful. This is how it works. And I felt like I got the right basis straight off the bat about what ChatGPT is and what it's good for and how it works. But a lot of people that are just reading the headlines can are scared that ChatGPT can take over your job or students are going to use it to cheat. The other thing at the time is that OpenAI sent it out over the internet and they did not provide any instructions or very little instructions on what it is or how to use it. And when you would type things into ChatGPT, it looks like it, ChatGPT knows what it's doing. Like, I like this quote, some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't you think? And when you look at ChatGPT, it really looks like it knows what it's talking about. Um, and until you start to investigate further, which a lot of people did, and that's why we're seeing so many um, articles popping up now and so many journal articles proving that ChatGPT cannot be used for things such as citations. Because when you look into it further, you realize that it's not. And a lot of fears came with this too. Um, a lot of people are thinking that science fiction and AI takes over. Um, I saw one link related to the Terminator movies and Skynet um, about how AI is going to take over our world. There's a lot of misinformation and disinformation. So just to clarify, misinformation is false information that is spread regardless of the intent to mislead. So, and then disinformation is a subset um, of information where it is knowingly spread, that the misinformation is spread on purpose, intentionally. So there's a lot of fears coming out for both misinformation and disinformation. Uh, the media hype, as I mentioned, people were starting to fear for their jobs. Um, they're concerned about academic cheating. And there's a lot of different ethical concerns that also come out of this, such as plagiarism and bias. So just going back to the basics, um, artificial intelligence is an umbrella term for any theory, computer system, or software that is developed to allow machines to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. So although it's called artificial intelligence, it is not what we see in, so in science fiction. It's not a robot with, that is smarter than humans. Humans still create anything that uses artificial intelligence. So there's three major types of artificial intelligence. So we have artificial neural intelligence, and it's also referred to as stage one. And this is an example of machine learning. So I'm sure most of you have heard about machine learning in the past. And uh, narrow artificial intelligence specializes in one problem. So it's trying to solve one thing. So some examples would be Siri, Alexa, and Contana, all of these voice actor activated assistants. They, they're, the one problem they're trying to solve is to understand our speech and to provide us information based on what we tell it. Uh, if we start to look at stage two, we have machine intelligence, so artificial general intelligence. And this refers to a computer that as, is as smart as a human across the board. So whereas artificial narrow intelligence is just focusing on one problem and maybe and is able to do possibly one problem very well, 
artificial general intelligence is going to be hundreds of problems that make it equivalent to a human so that it can do all of the same things that we're able to do. Uh, in stage three, this is what we see in science fiction. And this is what a lot of media and tech companies wanted us to believe what was happening with chat GPT because it was in their favor. Media sold articles and it got, if they weren't selling their papers, they were getting ad revenue from people clicking on them. So it was very clickbaity. Big tech companies were getting people to use their programs. So when we're talking about stage three, this is machine consciousness. And this is when we're talking about a possible intellect that is smarter than the best human brain in almost every field. So when we're actually looking at ChatGPT, we're still in that narrow, artificial narrow intelligence range. We're not even getting close to being close to a human. ChatGPT is still really only solving one problem. And I'll tell you what that problem is later. Some examples of artificial intelligence that we're used to seeing in our everyday lives and we may not even realize it. Uh, chatbots, a lot of the time you're getting these little chatbots popping up in the corner of your screen when you're on uh, web pages for people trying to sell you things. We have the smart assistants like Siri and Alexa, um, e-payments, search algorithms, media streaming, smart cars. Interesting enough, smart cars are still narrow AI because every single decision they make is still programmed by a human. Uh, navigation apps, facial recognition, text editors, social media feeds, you see artificial intelligence all over the place and not necessarily realizing it. And every single one of these examples are all narrow AI. There is actually, and maybe I'm wrong on this, I don't have a citation behind me, but I don't think there is anything that has been officially proven as general AI created yet. Or if it is, it's in a secret lab somewhere. So this is the talk that I was telling you about. I highly recommend it. Fantastic overview to AI and academia, and he does an incredible job explaining how ChatGPT works. Um, I don't know if I can even do it justice, so I highly recommend watching his video. Uh, Daniel Lametti, he's a psycholinguistics scholar and faculty member at Acadia University. And he, um, in his presentation, he does a lot of explaining about how large language models are created and how it relates to how humans language development. So there was actually a pre-question that came out that said, how does the computational reasoning done by generative language models differ from creative human thinking? Whoever suggested that, or if you're interested in that topic, watch this video. So I just want to pull out a few things that he shared uh, because I feel that they are really useful for us to consider. Um, so he talks about how late humans learn language, such as children learn language based on statistical regularities in speech. He says that humans are great at learning linguistic patterns. Humans learn language with less input than ChatGPT did. Uh, learned associations allow us to understand and produce language quickly. Another thing that he brought up is this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He was saying that in this book and in the theory, fast thinking is considered system one and slow thinking is consist considered system two. Um, fast thinking is prob probabilistic. So examples are Wordle. Um, if you're filling out a Wordle puzzle, you really if you have all the all the access to all the words, all the five letter words in the world that could be used for Wordle, you could very, and you have a supercomputer, you can very quickly calculate the probability of what the word might be, especially when you start to get clues to narrow down what the word might be. Like there's an A in it, just not in this spot, or there is an A in this spot. Slow thinking, on the other hand, 
is system two and it's deterministic. And this is where we are using um, our critical thinking problems. So ChatGBT is still a system one thing. It is using probability. So again, another example straight from Dan, Daniel Lametti, um, system one versus system two examples. So a bat and ball cost $1.10. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much is the ball? In system one, it sees two numbers. It sees one ten and one. So it assumes that the ball costs 10 cents. There's not much logic going into it. It's not reading and interpreting the content. It is just predicting what the most likely word is that comes next. In, yeah, so this is it showing you that the ball cost 10 and the bat cost $1.10. In system two, um, this is where you have to think and consider. So this is where going back to childhood when you're learning all of these um, language number problems, a bat and ball cost $1.10, the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, how much is the ball? So this is when we're starting to think that the ball costs five cents because and the bat costs a dollar five to total a dollar ten. And remember, ChatGPT is system one. It's not able to do this. So back to ChatGPT, what is it? Well, in order to understand more about what ChatGPT is, we need to think about some different definitions. So we already learned what artificial intelligence is. Um, so the next thing we need to consider is that it's a part of machine learning. And this is a field that develops and uses algorithms and statistical models to allow computer systems to learn and adapt without needing to follow specific instructions. So an example would be asking the GPS on your phone to calculate the estimated time of arrival at your next destination. Uh, generative AI is a subset of machine learning. And it is a type of artificial intelligence that's capable of generating text, images, or other media in responses to prompts. So when you think about generative AI, you think about it's generating content, but it's still based on statistical probability. Natural language processing is the field of artificial intelligence where the computer science meets linguistics and it allows computers to understand and process human language. So when we're looking at ChatGPT, it is actually a large language model. And when we're looking at language models, as we've already been talking about, is a language model is a probability distribution over a sequence of words and calculating what the most next likely word is. And it, and it generates the probability based on a text corpora, so which is a huge amount of text. But this is just the language model. The large language models, um, and what we are currently seeing with ChatGPT, is the largest language model that has ever been created. And that's one of the reasons why it's so impressive. Um, because the large language models are generated on billions of pieces of text. And the large language models create tokens, which then are mapped to numbers to make the um, mathematical equations compute faster. So when you're looking at a text, you can see that common words or phrases could be mapped into one token. So you could have a phrase such as where is be one token. And you could also have like a full word, like word, be a token. ChatGPT specifically was trained on 500 billion tokens of text. And each training set was given a specific weight um, for when the, to calculate the probability of the words. So as you can see in this chart, there were a common crawl and it created 410 billion tokens. And this common crawl, I'm assuming of the internet, uh, was weighed at 60%. So 60% 
of chat. So ChatGPT is using ge general content of the internet um, to help provide its information. Um, it has another data set called Web Text 2, and that is 19 billion tokens, and that's only and that's given a lower percentage weight in the training mix of 22%. They have two corporas of books that they used, and between them, we're looking at 70, 67 billion, um, but the books are only given an 8% weight. And then Wikipedia um, generated 3 billion tokens and was given a 3% weight. Another way to think about this and is our cell phone keyboards. A lot of the times when we're using our cell phones, we're typing in words and it's and it's using natural language processing, not at the scale of ChatGPT. We're using the language model scale um, to suggest next words. And it's also adapting to you specifically because you will start to notice that if you use certain words more frequently, those are going to be the one that it starts to suggest next. Um, I know in my case, every time I start to type Margaret, like M-A, it pops up Margaret every time I start. And I never told it to do that. Or if I start to type in my address, it suggests to finish it. So basic text prediction generally work, looks like the boy ran up the. And then it will look at the probability of the next word. So sky might be assigned a 1% probability, chair might be 3%, road might be 50%, or hill might be 99%. And then since in a basic model, hill has the highest probability, it is the next suggested word. So if we take this to the scale that we're dealing with with ChatGPT, it extrapolates into creating entire sentences, paragraphs, and essays. Uh, some limitations that we are seeing um, include limited knowledge, the training set that ChatGPT used, and I should have wrote this down because I forget, but I think it ended in 2021. Um, so it does not have any more recent knowledge. So if you asked it maybe about the current war on the Ukraine, it's not able to provide that information. And I could be wrong because I don't actually remember when that war started, but that's the general idea. Um, we all see the misinformation and the, the misinformation is happening because it is just being calculated on by the next probable answer. So a lot of the times you're not seeing, um, you won't necessarily see the most accurate or truthful response coming out from ChatGPT. You're seeing what the most next probable response would be. So another name that we're, that we're seeing and it's proliferating in media is calling it hallucinations. Uh, we're also seeing some disinformation, but I don't think any of this disinformation is coming specifically from chat BGPT. I, there's no intention of it. The chat GPT, the open AI, which is the creator of chat GPT, is before content is sent back to the user, they're running it through specific algorithms to check for bias. So it's really difficult or disinformation. So it's really difficult to get it to say mean things or to say maybe something very controversial that generally is unaccepted in the world. Um, so I don't think there's any intention. I don't think there's disinformation coming out of it because I don't believe it's intentional. But a lot of information coming out from it, if something wrong, um, I think Kaylin mentioned to me uh, about um, vaccines and autism. I think that was the combination. Caitlin, was that 
what you were talking about, vaccines? And well, autism. it was from the search layer consensus, which works on yes or no questions <clears throat> specifically for health sciences, and then it'll rate like level of agreement in the literature. And it's it's using the same kind of technology that's in chat GPT to yeah. search essentially. But yes, um, and it's not saying yes, they caught, but it's the first article shows that yes, um, vaccines cause autism. Um, yeah, just some problem. And that's generally happening, not because there's an intentional um, misinformation being shared, but there's a lot of information available on the internet about vaccines and autism. There's a lot of people believe that vaccines cause autism. There's a lot of scientific literature disproving it, but just because the, the way that the algorithm was trained, which we don't fully understand, even the creators claim they don't fully understand how it's been trained, is that it likely sees those two pieces of information together and calculates them at a higher probability, even though the scientific literature says that vaccines do not cause autism. So we also see some limitations for the same reason about bias. So we're, um, as I mentioned, naturally inclined towards ideas that have the most content and not truth. It's trained on what we expect to be moral and ethical. Um, which can limit intellectual inquiry because you have to coax alternative thinking out of it. And there's also the confirmation bias that we see in social media and um, where you tend to get the information back sent back to you based on your own opinion. Because if you wanted to ask ChatGPT, what is the link about autism and vaccines, you could phrase it in a way to suggest to ChatGPT how you wanted to answer without realizing it because of your own um, thoughts on it, causing a confirmation bias. Um, there's privacy concerns. Um, Chat OpenAI is a big tech company. Their goal is to make money. Um, so they claim that you can turn off the, that I can't remember if everyone can or if just pro members can, um, can keep their privacy when using it. But for definitely for free users, the benefits that the company is getting out of you using it is your personal information and interactions to continue to train the chat GPT. Uh, there's limitations on creativity. It doesn't come up with anything new, no matter what it looks like, uh, because it's just it's taking content that it has statistically created or that it has looked at and calculated the statistics on the next word. So it may look creative, but it's not. And this is definitely where we run into some copyright issues because depending on the text that it was trained from, um, it can spit out copyrighted information and not even warn you. So some more ethical concerns, um, we have like the trust in of big tech industries. Um, again, the privacy. So we don't actually know how these algorithms work. Um, and to some point, the big tech companies don't even know how it was trained and how it created responses. Because at some point, um, when you're looking at machine learning, the, machine, the AI is supposed to take over its own um, calculations. I want to use the word learning again, but it starts to evaluate the content and make its own, and decisions isn't the right word, but it's really hard and really complicated for humans to follow. Another consideration is that these big tech companies are paying low wages to humans to train chat GPT. So every time you see, I'm sure they're watching all of the media articles and they're seeing chat GPT is throwing out wrong citations. So they actually have people going into chat GPT and training it specifically to stop giving bad citations. And that's why um, a few weeks later, a few months later, they released chat GPT 4 and it was better at citations but it's because they have people going in there being paid really poorly 
to fix to fix the concerns and it's not actually the AI that's fixing it. Um, it's also currently being artificially incentivized. Uh, we saw this happening um, in the past with cloud storage when we when a lot of companies were offering Dropbox, OneDrive for really low and they said you get unlimited storage and now we're seeing that they're raising their prices. So what is ChatGPT? What is OpenAI going to do with ChatGPT? Right now they're offering it for free. You can get a pro subscription for $20, but they're losing millions of dollars offering this software and it's likely to get us hooked so that we will continue to use it. They're also um, taking advantage of people because they're letting the world and us figure out what chat, what their own software can do. And as we use it and as we figure out what it can do, we're helping to improve their software. Um, plagiarism and copyright, again, uh, we're looking at it's using content that is already exists and is already written, and we don't know how it's sending the information back to us. And there is also concern about the erosion of the middle class workforce. So there are real employment threats, um, but we have seen all of these before. Um, so we saw these in the Industrial Revolution. Machines took over some of the um, some of the creation of textiles, but you still needed human intervention and the jobs change. Another example is photography. Um, 30 years ago, you really had to know how to use your your camera in order to take good pictures. Now we have all these filter apps on our phones. So photographers still exist, but they're being used differently. So there's gonna be changes to existing jobs. And some of these jobs are going to be improved, and some of them may not be. So there is concern that there may be, the new jobs that come out of this may be less desirable and there may be a bigger gap between upper and lower classes and that middle class might start to shrink even more. So what is ChatGPT really great at? It's really great at generating text. That is what it is. It's a text generation generator. So some great uses for ChatGPT, and I'm sure this is a real thing, but I would like to think that I coined the term black blank page syndrome. So I've seen blank page everywhere, but the blank page syndrome, I'm going to pretend that I coined that. And that's when students, anyone, especially me, looks at a blank page and has a really hard time starting to write. We've all had those exercises in class where the prof is like, okay, start writing, start brainstorming and writing. And it's really hard to start with a blank page. So, so, so ChatGPT can be really good at maybe creating a scaffold for your work um, to help you start brainstorm ideas. Um, it's really good at idea generation. It's also really good at word suggestions, such as synonyms and rephrasing things. Um, in the same vein, it's really good at connecting and summarizing and just to compose across a vast span of knowledge because it has so much information available to it, way more information than we have in our own brains. But it is a text generator. So what is ChatGPT? It's a smart chatbot. So all of this talk about ChatGPT, but we're seeing all of these other AIs that have been popping up, especially since January, um, that are offering all kinds of different tasks that you can use. And what this is, is ChatGPT is actually based on GPT 3.5, which is a foundation model owned by OpenAI. And not everybody has the capacity to train their own large language models. So foundation models come in um, where you can use someone else's model instead of training your own. So OpenAI sells access to their GPT 3.5 model, which is not chat, it's just the generative pre-trained transformer. And they let companies 
use it and they're letting them use it for extremely cheap right now. So again, they're using that incentivi artificially incentivizing it. And it's, and all these companies using their GPT is also training it. But when you see all of these other pages pop up, such as Elicit, which is one of Caitlin's favorites, um, and Elicit does citations really well. But what it is, is because it's using that same GPT model with 500 billion tokens in it, but then the software developers for Elicit specifically are training it to write correct citations. And that's why we're seeing a lot of these other applications pop up um, that look like they can do tasks better than ChatGPT. And the other reason why they can do these better than ChatGPT, if we go back to think about the air, narrow artificial intelligence, is because they're being trained to do one job really well. Elicit is being trained to find scientific research and give you their citations, and that's the job that it's trained to do well. If you ask it to do something else, you're going to get wrong information. Um, that's what we're also seeing with ChatGPT. It's a chatbot. It's generating text. It was never meant to create citations. Should it have? Absolutely. But the creators of ChatGPT never foresaw the citation problem that we're seeing now. Um, some tips for using ChatGPT. Um, ask it how to use it. Feed it information. So if you want to um, get ChatGPT to do it some do something for you, give it information into the chat and then ask it to do something for you based on what you gave it. Another term that we're seeing popping up everywhere is prompt engineering. Um, so this is, you can usually find really good tr tricks or tips on the internet if you do a search for prompt engineering and chat GPT, and it'll give you really good suggestions. Um, you can ask it to respond as if you are a prolific writer. And I say prolific writer because there has to be enough of that author's content available in the text corpora that it used to generate its model. You, it can also um, respond as if you're a famous person. Again, if there's enough information in that text corpora that was used to train the model. You can also ask it to respond as if it was a specific audience. I'm sure a lot of us have heard of explain as if I'm five. Um, so you can ask it to take a complicated topic and explain it as a five-year-old or to a high school student or to a university student. I like to do this when I'm feeding it information and then asking it at the same time to respond in one of these ways. Um, ask it for specific quantities of text. So say, write one paragraph, write two paragraphs, write 10 bullet points. And you can also provide it examples. Um, some of the ways that I really like to use ChatGPT is I definitely like feeding it content. And then I ask it to write specific things. And then I tell it, change this, change that, rewrite. And it, until I find the content that I want. It's also really useful if you just have a train of thought and you don't want to put it in a sentence right now or you can't think about how to phrase it, just to write your chain of thought in and say, rewrite this and then put your train of thought in. Uh, it's great for writing emails, uh, synthesizing information. Again, I like it for rephrasing my own words and ideas. It's great for brainstorming. And the new ChatGPT can write puns. ChatGPT 3.5 was not able to come up with puns. They all ended up coming back to me as knock-knock jokes, but ChatGPT 4 can write puns. And the one thing that I'm constantly doing when I'm using ChatGPT is that I'm editing. I edit, 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 because every time you put stuff in, look at what it tells you, Evaluate it, use your critical thinking, edit what it's saying, rephrase it, copy it into your Word document or your text editor, rewrite it, use it as a starting point. And I think the best way to think about ChatGPT is to consider it another tool in your toolbox. And now I'm going to pass this on to Caitlin.
Thanks, Margaret. So I'll just skip over to the next slide. And I'm just going to quickly really focus in on higher education and libraries. Just pop over to the next slide. So um, Ithaca did a kind of report looking at who is talking on campus the most about ChatGPT. And this should be no surprise to most of us on the line. That's IT professionals, libraries, and our teaching in library teaching and learning professionals. Next slide. This group here did a scan of over 2,000 college and university websites in Canada states to look at how ChatGPT was being talked about online um, from universities and colleges. So they found mostly it was opinion and lectures being posted. There were some reports on experimental AI and then grading and other policies were coming out. And the people, the units on campus that were seemed to be putting out the most statements or the most visible about putting out a statement online on the use of ChatGPT was our teaching and learning centers. In general, it seems like higher education is still at a really kind of basic phase of using this technology. Some institutions have really like assembled these cross-functional groups and are putting out lots of information and guidance on how or how not to be using it. Other institutions are um, a little bit more quiet and haven't put out as many statements. So it's really across the board, uh, very institutional specific. Next slide. So ChatGPT and academic libraries, uh, you know, I can't come here and tell you like, this is how you can and should use it. Uh, it's going to be so institutional specific. It's going to be, you know, specific to your job and your role. But a question I'd like to pose to everyone is just knowing what you know now from Margaret, how can ChatGPT help elevate our work and our roles here on campus? Um, here's just some ideas to get, you know, some things I thought of to get some ideas flowing. So when we start to think about research and reference support, I have these like four main buckets that really came to my mind. Uh, so one, discovery. I'm, I love <laughs> searching and stuff like that. So all things searchy. So yes, ChatGPT can definitely help with discovery, can help suggest databases. It can help mine for synonyms. Um, you know, these plugins that we were, you know, Margaret was talking about earlier, or not plugins, but these other applications that are using the similar technology like Consensus or Elicit, all these other AI enhanced applications are like way better than what Google Scholar has ever been produced. Uh, so there's lots of, you know, potential there. Um, it can help sometimes with concept selection. You know, sometimes our users really struggle to transition from their question to like, what do you actually type in? It can help with that. Research synthesis and concept mapping is another area that uh, ChatGPT could help with. Writing support, this is something that's talked about a lot. So as Margaret mentioned, it's really great for outlines, like giving you structure, not content. Uh, papers, presentations, emails, you know, editing. You could, you know, come from different tones, write for different audiences, changing citation styles. You know, if you need to reformat a reference or something, translation, there's, you know, lots of options here. There's lots of different um, programs and software come out. Uh, I'm going to say in one more word, tune here, which isn't telling you like ChatGPT, this is how to write it, but it gives you options to select from. Like maybe this would be really helpful uh, for some, some of your students in terms of like, they're going to have to pick, like this is the best way to finish this sentence. Brainstorming, it is great at coming up with ideas sometimes. So, you know, if you're trying to brainstorm a title for a presentation or a research topic, you know, there is a lot to be said for sometimes just kind of that getting unstuck idea. And sometimes to come up with a good idea, you have to come up with lots and lots and lots of bad ideas. So chat GPT can, you know, help come up with a lot of those bad ideas that might help someone think of a new idea. It can be really good about connecting things we might not have connected, like how is an apple related to a pine cone? I don't know. I, I'm not a very creative person, but maybe ChatGPT could help with that. Um, an example I saw was like 50 uses for a paper clip. Like I can think of maybe three, um, but you know, it can just kind of help that creative process for some people, especially if you're feeling a little bit stuck. And I'll go to the next slide. So this is just a quick little discovery example. I work in health sciences. Uh, this is a PubMed search, so next slide. ChatGPT did a great job of coming up with synonyms, came up with uh, caffeine from coffee, found some mesh terms. Next slide. 
did not do a good job here at split up my phrase breast cancer to breast and cancer. So this will be an opportunity to engage with and talk with learners. Next slide. And I'm gonna skip, yeah, this one here. So it did a good job here with this next question with synonym generation, but if we go to the next one, wrong concepts. So what I'm trying to do, show here is, yes, it's good for some things. Uh, and when it comes for searching, I just asked it to write a PubMed search here. Not so good at other things. I just see lots of opportunity for engagement, um, activities you can think of, uh, just ways to connect maybe with your learners. And this is just kind of pulling from my background here. Next slide. So yeah, as Margaret mentioned about the wrong uh, citations, false citations, hallucinating citations, I liked this um, paper here that investigated it. Uh, basically, they were looking um, from five articles, like questions investigating five articles recently published by the professional geographer and ChatGPT generated two to three uh, references for each question asked and all of them were wrong. But I really like this quote here. And I think that this is an important thing to think about and remember when we think about talking about ChatGPT with whoever our users are, is subject matter expertise is required. To know if ChatGPT is getting it right or not, you need to know. So they say like to identify and remove incorrect information, the need to identify correct information provided by the AI chatbot is a skill that students will also increasingly need. So I really liked that quote there. Uh, next slide. Just uh, some taxonomy here to start thinking about from scholarly communications, not saying ChatGPT can do all of this, but starting to give us some language to think about how could uh, ChatGPT help and support scholarly communications. Next slide. And when we start to think about publishing, um, you know, I could see a lot of stuff um, rolling out in our future talking about credit and copyright, like will algorithms get to be uh have hold copyright or will we start to see like author enhanced by algorithm sort of thing uh, so i think that that will be a really interesting conversation to watch roll out i could see lots of potential here for digital copy editing and reformatting of figures reformatting of citations instead of stuff going back to the team to reformat you know looking at strategies when i look at what's being communicated by publishers or people involved in publication. It's looking at for strategies to speed up this process. Uh, in terms of peer review, I think we're starting to see coming out from some major journals and some publishers that statement saying that, no, they are not going to be considering using this right now as a peer reviewer. Next slide. So in short, what I would like to say is I, I think there's opportunity here for uh, critical thinking opportunities, critical thinking conversations with whoever your, um, your user base is, whether you're thinking faculty or whether you're thinking different units on campus, whether you're thinking students, there's opportunity for conversation. Like this is what it can do. This is how it could help you. This is what you need to be aware of. And I see it as, yeah, like what Margaret is kind of emphasizing, another tool in our toolbox as a method to engage with our communities. However, I think that important note is that to know if it's got it wrong, you need to know enough. And I think that that is part of the um, tricky landscape for us to navigate moving forward. And next slide. So there are lots of examples going on in libraries. Some, you know, lots of librarians and libraries have been talking about this well before ChatGPT was on the scene. You know, McGill was one of them. So we have Amanda and Sandy from McGill Libraries. They have come up with the robot test, which is um, a framework you can use to help evaluate AI applications. And I'll pop that chat link into the chat box here. And um, then they've also been running workshops for their users. At the University of Toronto, they developed an open learning community a few years ago called the 99 AI Challenge, and I can pop a link into the chat if you wanted to read more about that, just to kind of show some ideas and highlight some work that is already going on in libraries. Not to say that this is a robust list, it's just, it's just highlighting some. Next slide. So yes, we have we are dealing with an unknown impact and unknown potential, but some questions I'd like to leave you all with is like, just think about you know your users and your needs and your roles is how could you use this technology to do what you do faster? And how 
could you use this technology to make your work easier and maybe less routine? Next slide. And as I was thinking about this presentation and how I wanted to kind of conclude it, I, would, I just kept thinking of Alice in Wonderland, like wandering into this like unknown landscape and unknown adventure, kind of on a journey. And I do think, you know, we have gone on journeys before as uh, library professionals, um, you know, navigating the misinformation, disinformation thing when that popped up a few years ago, uh, when, you know, everything shifted online and people are like, oh, is there even going to be a need for libraries? In navigating all of that. Um, so I think that this is just kind of another journey that we're on. Um, I don't have the answers about where we're going, but I, I'm just uh, kind of excited and curious to see uh, about what happens and how we could leverage this in our workplace. And last slide. Questions? Thank you. So this is a opportunity for folks if you want to put your questions in the chat or to turn on your mic and just ask them verbally. That uh, and Margaret and Caitlin will do their best to answer your questions. I know we threw a lot of information at you, <laughs> so if you do have any questions later, please feel free to email us too. I think I guess I'd say I'm curious about the concept of the reference interview and and whether you think an AI or, or chat GPT could handle that. Um, Did you want to answer that, Caitlin? Sure, I think like. I think right now I'm going to say no for most of them um, because usually you have to know those it's just it's so nebulous right and the users sometimes don't necessarily know their question yet and can't articulate it right and so they're not might not be giving chat gpt the right prompts to be working with and then it could just go sideways and as i've been kind of playing around with it it's just giving out so much wrong information right now so if they know the topic and they're like hey uh, what databases would be the best for this question yeah it could probably generate a pretty accurate list of that um but in terms of like you know when it's that really meaty question and uh you have a lot to work through i haven't seen evidence that it's there i think it'll take you on a really weird place and it'll be a big waste of time for the user i think my opinion but what i've really liked it for in reference interviews is suggesting keywords especially if you're at the reference desk and you're not familiar with the student's area of study and it's not one of your, the disciplines you work with um, i found it can be really helpful um, i'm going to let caitlin answer caitlin's keenan's question but i also just want to say very quickly that i've used elicit once for a um at the reference desk and I had a very specific English question come up and they it was incredibly specific. I could not help them find anything. I popped it into a listed and it came up with five citation examples and that were legit citations. So sometimes it can be really helpful or in that one scenario where I've used it, it was very helpful. But Caitlin, you can go ahead. Yes. I know I'm kind of at the same place as you, Caitlin, with Elicit. I have not been like rolling out a lot of communications and using it a lot with students yet. I definitely think I'm going to connect with my faculty a bit more before I do. And I also want to get more familiar with it. So I'm still playing around with it. I have showed it as you know, after sometimes if we were having a longer reference interaction and we've shown, you know, I usually show in PubMed or in CINAHL and stuff like that. And then I kind of mention it and then we talk about like, this is how it's displaying information. This is the information we're lacking. Like, I don't really know where it's pulling information from and how it's searching and stuff. But 
you can see that this kind of information is displayed, but you're going to need to double check this summary and stuff like that just as a because I don't see this technology going anywhere. I think this is going to be part of most of our students work in the future. So I think that for me, I, I'm trying to think about how to start having these conversations and encouraging those critical thinking skills now. Um, so they're as equipped as possible with whatever they're going to be doing later on. But no, I haven't, I haven't really, like, I'm not teaching it in class. I'm not promoting it heavily. Um, I, I do want to connect with my faculty a bit more and make sure like we're aligned and, and stuff like that before. And I want to know more about it. I'm just playing. So we are at the hour. Um, so I want to thank you both, Margaret and Caitlin, for such an interesting uh, introduction for me, uh, especially the back context that I actually hadn't really heard before in terms of what is the broader AI landscape and the different types of AI and things of that nature, which I had not heard before in other sessions on ChatGPT. So I thank you very much for that. And then also for just getting us to think a little bit more around how this really could integrate into our lives in our libraries and with our with our user communities. And just to remind folks that this uh, recording will be posted to the call website and the call YouTube channel. I will send a, an email out to everybody who registered uh, when the webinar is available, when the recording is available, and you will be able to uh, watch that and also view the slide decks after. Uh, and also the links that were in the chat will also be summarized uh, on the call website uh, for further viewing uh, later. <laughs>